welcome today and a special welcome to all those of you who uh, are members of the Grace Communion International Home Church who will be viewing this and welcome to all those of you who are watching this on YouTube and welcome to everyone who is here in attendance today. Welcome to the Reign of Christ the King Sunday and that's what we're celebrating here today. <clears throat> But today we're going to look at the book of Ephesians, and this epistle is interesting in that it is the least personal of all of Paul's letters. It's very formal, and it's almost devoid of references to the circumstances of either the writer or the readers. Interestingly, important early manuscripts even lack the name Ephesus in them. And perhaps what we commonly call the letter to the Ephesians should be viewed as a, a circular letter that was written by Paul and his co-workers to communicate Paul's teachings to many Gentile churches in the area of Asia Minor. Perhaps even some of the other six churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, that are near Ephesus, and you can see the names of those churches in the book of Revelation. Now, the most distinctive feature of Ephesians is the prominent atmosphere of prayer and worship. The Greek used is effusive with the traditional rhythms of liturgical prayers recited in the worship of the early Christian communities of the first century. Now, some of these rhythms we might call today chanting or even singing. Now, that's not commonly noted when you look at the book of Ephesians. And we're going to look especially at Ephesians chapter 1 today. And, you know, there are passages you might want to sing along with. And maybe you have never noticed that before, but I hope that you will notice it today and enjoy that. Now, in Ephesians, prayer is the vehicle that Paul and his co-workers used to teach theology. So with that bit of background, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and we will note that what it says is not only useful and encouraging to the Christians of the first century, but very much encouraging, helpful, and inspirational to all of us as Christians today. So we begin reading in Ephesians chapter 1 with verse 15. Now, this section of Paul's letter can really be outlined in three parts. Verses 15 and 16 are a thanksgiving. How appropriate. Verses 17 through 19 are a prayer. A prayer for all who read this letter. And then verses 20 through 23 are a majestic form of praise and worship to Christ the King and His reign over all things. All right, let's look at chapter 15, verse 1, the thanksgiving. Paul begins, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he begins for this reason. Well, what reason? Well, what he has just said, and if you read back through uh, the first few verses of chapter 1, he talks about this wealth of spiritual blessings that Christians have. He talks about knowing the purpose of God in Christ, which is a really special blessing that God has given us. He talks about how Christians are elected, called, and chosen people. He talks about our adoption as children of God. He talks about the Christian being redeemed, our redemption from sin. He talks about revelation, unveiling things and explaining things that no one else knows except as a gift of God through the power of the Spirit. And he, of course, talks about the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit and other things. So for this reason, he says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, now, that tells you something about their faith and their love, doesn't it? You can see it. It's tangible. It's, it's in their actions. 
It's in their behavior. It can be seen. So ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. It's a word you might want to become familiar with. Hagius, from the singular hagios, hagius, which literally means holy ones, holy ones. Sometimes we call them the saints. Well, who are they? They're God's people. Did you ever realize that you're a saint? You say, well, they haven't canonized me yet. No. Sorry about that. But no, from the biblical perspective, you are a saint. You are a holy one. Hagios. So your love for all of God's people. Verse 16, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. What does that tell you about Paul and how he prayed? Paul prayed without ceasing. Paul prayed continually. Prayer was a vital part of Paul's life and ministry. And by example, it ought to be of ours as well. I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering or making mention, not just a memory, but making mention. In other words, praying about you, making mention of you in my prayers. All right, verse 17, Paul's going to say, here's my prayer. Here's my prayer. Verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now we know what pray, Paul was praying about all the time. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, the Father of glory. And here we best understand glory not just as brightness or shining or splendor, but as majesty. Now, doesn't that make you want to sing a song? Majesty, worship his majesty. So our glorious Father may give you the spirit. Now what spirit? The Holy Spirit? Maybe. Spiritual gifts? Maybe. Maybe both. May give you the spirit. What kind of spirit? Now, it sounds like spiritual gifts here. The spirit of wisdom, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Revelation, that means knowledge revealed. As Paul loves the word, I don't know if you've noticed, mystery. So many things are a mystery. You know, I've always said there, there are two ways to answer any profound theological question. If someone ever asks you a profound theological question, you be prepared with two answers. One is, well, that's a paradox. Two is, well, that's a mystery. Anything else you want to talk about? Wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. In other words, a personal relationship. That's what it's about personal, not just knowledge, head thinking, but a personal relationship. I want to know you. I want to know you. Know him better. Know Jesus better. And Jesus is really the only way to know God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Only through Jesus do we have that knowledge of the great triune God. Verse 18. Paul says, I pray, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. I pray that, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to know you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened illuminated, open, revealed. Christ is the revealer, the revelation that we have. Enlightened in order that you may know, again, a personal relationship, the hope, and that you may know the certainty of the hope, certainty of the future, to which he has called you, to which God has invited, chosen, beckoned, invited, welcomed, and called you, to the riches, to the wealth of his glorious inheritance, all that is God's, he wants to share with you. 
like passing on an inheritance from a father to a child. He wants to pass on all he has to each of us. The glorious inheritance. Now, what is the inheritance? Well, that kind of refers back to the promise God made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Israel, to the children of Israel. The promised land. The promise. Now, what's our promised land? Some might say heaven. I would say the new heaven and new earth. That's our ultimate promised land. And you know what God has going to do? He is going to give us that land. That's going to be ours. It's going to be our dwelling forever. He's passing on that inheritance to us. So passing on his inheritance and his holy people. What's the word? What do you think is the word there? Hagios. His holy people, his saints. Now you think about the church. Do we think about ourselves as holy people? That's what Paul calls us. We're holy ones. We're saints. Can you imagine that? Do you feel very holy? I mean holy with an H, not holy with a W. Uh, Are you holy people? Wow. The The church is the restored Israel. The church is the true people of God. Therefore, we have the true and ultimate inheritance of the new heaven and new earth. And his, uh, verse 19 is interesting in the NIV, at least I think so, and his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength. Verse 20. Well, NIV translators... I found that difficult. So, you know what I did? I translated it myself from the Greek. Aren't you impressed? Well, hold your being impressed till you hear it. The way I would translate this, verse 19, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us, those believing according to the working of the might of his strength, which? Okay. To me, that sounds clearer, but let's look back at the NIV, and they leave out an important word, which I'll mention in a moment, and his incomparably, surpassing, his surpassing great power. What, What does Paul, do you think, mean by his surpassing incomparably great power? You know what that means? It means you can't understand it. Uh, How do we answer? Well, what is God's great surpassing incomparable power? Can you explain that? Yes, I can. It's a mystery. (laughs) Good answer. It's a mystery. It's it's beyond our comprehension. That's what it's beyond our comprehension, the power of God. So don't even talk about it. You can't figure it out. You can't express it. You just go, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and worship. That's all you can do. The incomparably great power for us, for for us who believe. That power, that dunamis, that's manifested power, God's accomplishments. He has the power to make things happen, to accomplish his will and his purpose. His power for us to believe, that power, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted. Okay, that's where I have trouble with NIV. We have might, strength, and exertion. (laughs) Okay? Might, the word means force or strength. Bulk up, take your protein powder. The force, the might, the strength. Okay, mighty, the might, the strength. And the word here means over things. See? Power to be over things, to make things change or be different by his might. He exerted energenon, energenon. Uh, you hear anything in that? Energy. That's the word we get energy from. His energy, his work his operational power, again, to get things done. So, his might, his strength, his work. 
by which, I've translated, he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Do we ever think about the power of God to resurrect Jesus from the dead? The power of God to resurrect the dead? Now, according to nature, things die. According to science, they stay dead. But according to God, that which is dead can be made alive. So God created all things, and he created a natural order of things, except that he has the power to reach into the natural order of things and say, here's an exception. The dead can live. Why? Because I will it to be so. And he raised Jesus from the dead. Now, Jesus came forth from the dead bodily. Now, that kind of blew the minds of everyone in the first century era, Greco-Roman culture, philosophy, and religion. First of all, they'd say, why would you raise a dead body? Don't you know you have an immortal soul? They did not understand the value of the body which God created. But God says, I, I created bodies and they're good. And you are body. Yes, you are spirit, but you are body and spirit. And you're not truly, fully you without your body. So I'm going to raise your body or create a new body that's just like your old body. It'll be your body. And I'm going to raise it to life again. Wow. Now, when God raised Jesus from the dead, how did Jesus come forth from the tomb? He was human, wasn't he? He was a body. He showed Thomas wounds in his side and in his hands. He was a body. He was a human body. But he was glorified. He had a spiritual body. He was a human with a spiritual body. And Paul tells us that in the resurrection... You and I, too, will come forth with spiritual bodies. There had never been a spiritual body before. When Jesus came forth, a human, into a spiritual body, he's human, human, and spiritual. That had never, ever happened before. That was beyond all science and knowledge and logic. That's the power of God that made, hear me church, a new creation. This is something new. This has never existed before. And Jesus is the firstborn of many children who are going to be like this one day. Wow. A new thing the Lord has done by his great power and strength, according to his plan, according to his purpose, according to his will. And he seated him at his right hand, quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1, the exaltation of the king, the ascension of the king to the throne. So Jesus sits on the throne. This is his enthronement. That's what it means to sit at the right hand. He is enthroned as king with the power and authority of God. Exalted at his right hand. You know what I'd say to that? All hail King Jesus. Sorry, I just keep bursting in the song as I read through this. <laughs> Seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, in the heavenlies, in the region, in the dimension, if you will. Uh, it's the region from which he reigns in heaven. Far above, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked. Far above what? All. All. Rule and authority. The word translated rule is arche. Uh, you may recognize it from 
archangel, <laughs> angel meaning messenger, arche meaning rule. So what is an archangel? A ruling angel, a ruler, an angel who's in charge. Only one named in the, in the Bible. Who is it? Michael, very good. You remember that, yes. A ruling angel, but an arche, overall rule and authority, exousia, all power, dunamis, and dominion, karyotetos. In the book of Enoch, these are ranks, if you will, of angels. In Jewish thinking, when Paul wrote these words, if there was any Jewish thought among the people who read this, they would go, oh, you're talking about the ranks of the angels. Now, whether he literally was or not, I don't but, but you get the point of what he's saying is, so these angels have ranks. They have you know, this rank. And when I say angel, I mean a created being of different types, different perspectives given in the Bible about the various what we call angels. And they have ranks or levels. Of, but the, the, what's Paul's, Paul's point is, I don't care what rank they have. I don't care if it's Michael the archangel. Jesus is above all. He's the creator of all of these created beings. He is so far above the created order, you can't even begin to imagine or express it. Far above all rule and authority. Far above all kings. Oh, there I started singing again, sorry. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name above every name that is invoked, that is called upon, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come, for all eternity. Name above all names. Yeah, there we go again. Name above all names. Did you realize so many hymns came out of Ephesians 1? Do you realize Paul's writing in the Greek and the liturgical kind of rhythm just gives rise to praising God, praising Jesus, worshiping Him in song. Not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under His feet. I don't know if you've seen the old movies, but you know what? Uh, when you conquer someone... What do you tend to do? You go up with your sword and shield and you stand over their body and what do you do? You put your foot on them. And that's the imagery here. All things are under his feet. Why? He's conquered all. He rules over all. Everything is beneath his foot. He, all things are under his feet and has appointed or installed him to be head. And by head here, he, he literally means the physical head, but as a type, as a metaphor, for supremely presiding over, like we say, the head of a corporation or the head of government. He is the head over everything for the church, the ecclesia, the assembly, the gathering, the people of God. Who rules this church? Jesus. Has he gone off somewhere and left us? No. He still is our chief presiding officer to this day. CEO, chief executive officer of the church, is Jesus. He rules today. The head over everything for the church, which is his body. Whoa, okay. Explain to me how the church is the body of Christ. You know the answer. It's a mystery. But think about it. We are a part of Christ's body. His body is the church. All of us are in his body. And we take the elements of communion and we say, this is my body. Take this, do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood of the new covenant. How are the elements of communion a sacrament? It's a mystery. They are. We are the body of Christ. He is in us. We are in him. Wow. 
the fullness, the pleroma, that which fills or that is filled by, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus fills up everything in every way. He is our all in all. Jesus. He is our all in all. Amen to that. So what do we learn from this passage today in Ephesians? Well, we learn about prayer and worship from the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to ask Stephen if you would come up here and help me with this. Because this involves singing. That's not on my gift list. All right. Verse 18. You remember it? In verse 18, we learn to pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order to see and know better the great God. As Paul Belushi puts it, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Oh. And from verse 19, we learn to praise God for His greatness. And this comes from Chris Tomlin. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And I will see how great, how great is our God. And from verse 20, we learn to praise Christ who was raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven far above all other rulers, as written by Jeremy Riddle, Ross, uh, Ras Jackson, Peter Mathis, and Stephanie Gretcher. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Savior of the world. And from verse 21, we learn that His name is above all names from Paul Belosh and Lenny LeBlanc. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. And from verse 22, we learn that Jesus is exalted over Everything according to Twyla Paris. He is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. And from verse 23, we learn that Christ is our all in all, as Dennis Jernigan puts it. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. I'm seeking you like a precious jewel. Lord, give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Thank you, Stephen. And as we conclude today, please join with me in prayer. Father, we come to you through the Son and in the Spirit to praise and to worship you. Thank you for the words of instruction on prayer and worship from the Apostle Paul. We pray that by your grace and through your Spirit that you will give us the gifts of faith, hope, and love. We pray that we daily will come to know you better and have a deeper and more intimate relationship with you. To this end, dear Lord, we pray. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to know you. I want to know you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.